When I think of the Puget Sound or the Salish Sea, I think of salmon. They feed a community, and not just physically, but emotionally, culturally. Salmon have a very complex and diverse life history that touches on everything from the mountains to freshwater all the way out to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The Salish Sea Marine Survival Project was a really large international study to look at the health and survival of juvenile salmon and steelhead in Puget Sound. The two major factors that we learned from that study are that it looks like there are changes in the food web that are affecting particularly Chinook and Coho that spend more time in Puget Sound. Changes in the timing of the food that's available, changes in the amount of food that's available, and changes in the quality of food that's available. When I say food, that means things like zooplankton and small forage fish. The ecosystem level approach to management of keystone species throughout Puget Sound is extremely important and is the basis for most of the research that Long Live the Kings gets involved in and taking a food web, ecosystem-wide lens to solving problems. Long Live the Kings hatchery, Glenwood Springs up on Orcas Island, we've been rearing Chinook for well over 30 years. And one of the things that we've noticed is that we have had decreasing returns over time. And there are a couple of reasons we think for that. The, the marine environment is becoming less favorable, increased predation on juvenile salmon and steelhead as a result of larger populations of harbor seals, and also increasing phytoplankton blooms both in the spring and in the fall when they return. One of the things that we learned from the Marine Survival Project is there seems to be a disconnect between when salmon are in the environment ready to feed and when those resources are available. And one of the key food resources for those species are forage fish and particularly Pacific herring. The reason that there are changes in herring spawning timing has in part to do with climate. The herring that spawn later in the year have been reduced and the herring that spawn earlier in the year have increased and then they are growing ahead of the salmon. So one of the strategies that we're thinking about is how can we change how we operate the hatchery? Can we essentially manipulate the life history of the fish so that they are better adapted and able to deal with these changes in the environment? One outcome we're hoping it would lead to is fish that return older and bigger. Long of the Kings is working with a number of partners to try to address some of the issues that we've learned about in the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. One is we're working on trying to restore forage fish habitat and or create enhanced habitat for forage fish in South Puget Sound. Some of our projects target recovering herring spawning habitat and adapting traditional harvesting practices to supplement the spawning habitat and to also understand where spawning populations are and what might be driving herring abundance. Long Live the Kings has partnered with the Fort Gamble Skullam Tribe, the Nisqually Indian Tribe, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the University of Washington to essentially assess habitat use and identify recovery techniques for Puget Sound herring. What we've done is taken an indigenous practice and adapted it to essentially use evergreen boughs and trees as artificial spawning substrate. So we cut these young hemlock branches weighted down with a rock anchor so that they'll hang vertically in the water column. Herring are this really critical food source for many different creatures over this period of time that starts in the winter when other food sources are really scarce. You can't really overstate the importance of herring to the Salish Sea ecosystem. They're definitely a foundational species in a lot of ways, ecologically and, and culturally. Humans can have a really positive impact on our environment. A lot of First Nations and tribal communities, their cultural knowledge had and is still having a really positive impact on the environment. And we can use those techniques too to also be helping and not just, you know, studying what's going wrong, but trying to make a positive impact.